All right, so here I, we have a friend, uh, this little horseshoe crab that we found. Um, and uh, if you could just tell us a little bit about these things. They have some very interesting features on them that I thought we should just kind of look at and, uh, and tell people what, what they're looking at when they're looking at a horseshoe crab. We have to um, kind of look at the major portion of the physiology. It's called a prosoma. As in vertebrates, um, they're going to, at some point in time, in order to grow, they're going to molt. Uh -huh. And they move out of that, um, out of their shells in that way. But some of the characteristics of the prosoma is that they have um, compound eyes, a pair of compound eyes you can see here. They also have um, at least a dozen or so what are called primitive eyes or ocelli. And you can s just see the remnants of those in the front here. And uh, basically these animals, because of their reproduction, um, they need to have some kind of um, uh, what is called luminosity. They have to be able to uh, detect a full moon or a new moon, uh, and they are synchronized to the high tides that come ashore. But they're basically, they're an entire animal that's sensitive to the light, and they can, they can um, detect those slight changes um, in, uh, in the conditions of the moon uh, and along the shoreline. Uh, they're also, um, they're portion here is a, is a telson. You'll see the tail uh, at mm. the end there. Uh, the telson is not dangerous. This animal is, is, is as safe as can be. Uh, the telson is basically used as a, like a fulcrum. It's, it's to turn itself over if it gets onto the shoreline. And many times if you see um, along the beach, you walk along the beach, you'll see all of these what we call telson marks all along the shore where they try to get the right angle on depending on the slope of the beach to turn themselves over. Mm. Um, the, uh, the, the animals themselves are in their own family. Uh, they're called Chalicerae, and the Chalicerata are animals that are basically have their mouth parts surrounded by their legs. And if oh. you take a look at the, 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 the numbers of legs here, so you see these appendages, the, um, the two smallest appendages here are, are to move food to their mouth parts. This is their mouth parts here. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a bristle area. They have a beak. And as they move food through there, they, they w basically work on things that are in the benthic, the bottom portions of bays and estuaries. They, uh, they'll uh, consume mussels. We've seen them kind of graze on mussel beds in, in inlets because of the, the good water movement. Uh, as they come ashore, they, they also um, will work on what is called detritus. So they call this whole group of organisms that eats dead and decaying things. So, and that's important in, in the ecosystem. The, uh, the other part of their physiology that's really important is uh, these gills. They, they're called book gills because, uh, as you can see here, they're like pages in a book. Mm -hmm. um, their um, maleness and femaleness is in the first book page, if you will, on, on, in the, uh, on page the book of gills. The book. That's the page of the book. This is a male. Um, and you can tell that by another physiological characteristics of them that differentiate males and females in that first appendage. Um, here's a kind of a blow up of that. You can see the male's appendage has this hook. And that hook is important in, in um, the reproductive process because the, the hook attaches to the ep ep uh, this second portion of the main of the outer carapace and, um, or to the under portion of this in what is called amplexus. And you can tell the difference also between the males and females is the females have a reproductive scar that is here. So the older they get, the, the deeper and more pronounced the scar is, and it tells you that they've been about for, for quite some time. Wow. The, the uh, m females' first appendages are the, again, wispy type claws. They're, they're not very, they're not for cracking things open. They're mostly mm -hmm. for moving sediment and moving into, into the shoreline. Yeah, I was just letting them pinch me right there, and it, you don't even feel. Uh you don't feel anything really. So. Yeah, they're really, they're not, not, that's not for predation. And, and the last appendage you can see here is it's almost like a feathering, a feather duster, and that's really to move, uh, try to keep water around eggs when they, when they put them into the sediment or if the male is dispersing sperm, enough of sperm to distribute over the entire female. Fantastic. The reproductive process of, of this animal, again, th these are 
um, from the standpoint of Earth history, uh, they're uh, they're related to spiders and scorpions. So they're, they're arthropods in the classic sense of things, but of course they're in their own family. Um, they're related to scorpions and spiders um, uh, as their closest um, cousins, but the ancestrally they're related to an animal that predominated the earliest oceans on Earth, um, which are the trilobites. And mm. trilobites, and in New York State, uh, the, the state fossil, the eurypterids, were the same type of thing. The predominantly invertebrates uh, living on the bottom of the paleo oceans. And, um, and these animals have been around quite some time uh, that they've actually crawled below the, the legs of brontosauruses and they survived uh, five mass extinction events. So, so they, they've been true as they've been described as living fossils. It's a little bit of a um, uh, well, maybe a, yeah, kind of a theatrical <laughs> statement, but that's okay. Uh, they well, are. It is uh, an ancient uh, order, and uh, certainly they've been the, this uh, species or something like it have been walking on this planet for um, I think since the uh, all the continents were together, right? Yeah, th these these are, are basically um, both of the. Continental movements, Pangaea and Gondwana, both of those uh, um, geological transitions, uh, these animals, and, and actually an artifact of that of, is the fact that these animals are found only on the eastern sides of continents. So you'll find Limulus polyphemus, this species, along the east coast of the United States, um, from Maine down to, literally to, you can put a flag on the beach in Tallahassee and you won't find them west of that in the <laughs> Gulf. And then you go to the Yucatan Peninsula at the tip of the Yucatan, and they're found right there on the beach in Mexico. And that's it in North America. And then it, there are three additional, there are only four species of, of horseshoe crabs on Earth, and um, the other three are in Asia. Um, uh, two are, are called, the genus is Tachypleus, and the fourth is Parsonoscorpius, and they're found in the Bay of Bengal on the east side of India. And they're found from uh, basically uh, J uh, China and the southern portions of Japan, the South Islands of Japan, through the China coast, um, around uh, Hong Kong, into, into um, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and then the Philippines. And in all of those areas there um, are predominantly the, the two other species, what are called the Tachypleus, that's their genus. Um, are the predominant one. And if you were to look at these animals, you, they're almost indis indistinguishable. You wouldn't really tell too much about them. They have slight characteristics. Uh, but when you even go back to the earliest known uh, fossil um, horseshoe crab, which is called Paleolimulus, um, 445 million years ago, if you put them right next to one another, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So, which that makes right? that unbelievable from the standpoint of speciation and evolution from the standpoint of the changing this animal its physiology its biology its ecology works now what can we learn from that we can learn a little bit about their habitat we can learn a little bit about their reproductive process and um, and that leads to the to um, that alone the paleo interest should be enough to have them survive and to protect them uh, but their they're synchronized, their reproductive process is synchronized with literally millions of birds that migrate in North America along the Atlantic Flyway. Right, and, the um, red knots uh, specifically, right? Yes, yeah. and, and the red knots have, um, have some concerns recently. The, the last um, decade or so, the numbers have been dwindling, and, um, and the, the reason that that is the case, they believe, is because of issues with the horseshoe crab. A single female horseshoe crab will lay uh, between 80 and 100,000 eggs a season. Wow. So they keep these into the sediment. Um, the eggs, if you, the population numbers on horseshoe crabs, North American horseshoe crabs, it, it has a range. Uh, they, we, uh, some scientists and people have said there's about 4 million crabs. Some said there's 30 million crabs. So actually we don't really know. Um, so the idea, though, is that the animals do come ashore each, each season, uh, b beginning in May and uh, June and July. High tide, full moon, and new moon is their uh, critical breeding portion. And they come along the beach, 
the females, um, the males usually come ashore first, females then come ashore, and then male, a single male will hook up with a single female. And then there are tons of what they call satellite males that kind of surround and wait for an opening if they have an opening, if, a, if, fema if right. the male uh, releases the female. But in, for all intents and purposes, they all contribute um, s some genetic contribution to the, to the developing larvae. Um, now, I know um, we're trying to get a grip on the, the population numbers, and what I've seen are some groups that have gone out to tag these. Mm -hmm. Is that to try to get a population census? Because I know they're looking for um, how many come back and, and return to the beach. Would that help with, uh, with the numbers and, and counting of, of the total population? It would, and, and just about any effort um, to get some knowledge of these animals, as much as we know about them, is that's how, how much we don't know about them, but um, <laughs> we, uh, there, there's been tools that have been used over the years. That it doesn't hurt the animal, really. Again, they mm. have to be mature, though. They can't, they can't be animals that molt, mm -hmm. because anything that you put on the animals will disappear. There's all types of tags. Uh, we've had students put radio tags on them, so kind of little, put little epoxy and put this uh, kind of, uh, and they track them out, and if they're, they're mature, and we've seen the animals um, uh, repeatedly come back to the same beaches, similar to, to what turtles do, but with a much larger, uh, much shorter uh, migratory route. So mm -hmm. uh, here in Hempstead Harbor, there could be animals that have been coming in and out of this harbor for, for as long as horseshoe crabs have been coming to Long Island. Uh, but um, they, they, they have to be tagged when they're adults. When they're, when, if they're still immature, the molts, as this is a molt here, um, mm -hmm. the molts uh, basically are left behind and whatever you attach to it will be left behind. Right. And um, so... Now, this yep. is a, a molt. How many molts do they go through? Is it like, it's, it wasn't, I heard like 18 or, or something like that, yeah. 13? It, it actually, there's two different uh, molting cycles. The males uh, about 16 times generally 16 times, females 17 times, uh -huh. one additional molt, and uh, that's over a span of between nine and 11 years. So wow. that any of the animals, those eggs that are put into the beaches today, um, the odds are one in three million that one of those eggs will actually become a sexually mature animal and be back on that beach in nine to 10 years. Wow. So th th this is a, an interesting thing and, and I'm, and you bringing up the point about this is very important because I, um, conservation biology, uh, the general public will, will see, well, there's plenty of birds out there. There's plenty of horseshoe crabs. I see them all the time. Um, uh, this was the same um, statement made about American bison out west. Um, or the uh, passenger pigeon. Or any animal that has gone extinct, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's plenty of them, don't worry about them. Uh, passenger pigeons, they didn't even aim when they shot them. They would just shoot up in the air and they would fall out of the sky. And so numbers are not, is not a guarantee for survival uh, evolutionarily. So the important thing is to understand their biology and their ecology first because there's no guarantee the animals can't, and the pressures on these animals right now have skyrocketed in the last few years. And um, I can talk about the Asian species more so because these animals here have not necessarily been, you don't find these too, on too many dinner plates um, in the United States, but in Asia, um, all three of the species have become an exotic food, uh, a food that's been going there. And um, so people, people eat these? Absolutely. Wow. Um, they walk along uh, a, a, a pre-molt, uh, 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 an animal that's three or four years old or five years old. Um, people walk along the beach and they have like little hot dog stands for horseshoe crabs and then they sell them in Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, uh, in Indonesia, Malaysia, and um, in Singapore. Uh, they're harvesting uh, 10,000 animals a day Whoa. to take their meat and send them out into to, to the market. And there's not much meat here, but uh, then again, um, uh, marine organisms necessarily, especially invertebrates, it's not a, it's an acquired taste. Number one, number two, it's uh, it's uh, it's become more uh, like a delicacy in this this in this world here, and so hmm. more and more pressures on them. But I know, and I, I know around here that um, there is a fishing season on on horseshoe right. crabs here. But I heard they just chop them up for bait. Is that uh, that's correct? That's the pressure in the United States. Um, the uh, the animals are uh, fishermen believe for two particular species, conch and eel, 
and basically conch and eel. Uh, I'm of Itali Italian ancestry, so I remember my grandfather collecting a lot of eels and filling mm -hmm. up bathtubs with eels, and, um, and they used horseshoe crab as bait because there was a lot of protein. If they used the females, they had a lot of eggs and so on. Um, and that has been a tradition, and it has been used, and uh, there's been uh, an attempt to, to have artificial baits that could be used for those two fisheries, but they haven't been successful or they, it's been difficult to get over the hurdle of using these animals. They're harvested. In New York State, there's about 135,000 animals that are harvested each year, cut up and used for bait. So uh, and it's a permit system. Uh, it's controversial in the scientific community because primarily um, of a reason that's probably more important um, to humans than, than the idea of filling in a, a few commercial needs, which is, those are important, but the critical importance of horseshoe crabs is their blood. If it wasn't for their blood, uh, you and I and anybody who we know, um, in order to test medicines and pharmaceuticals and, and make sure that surgical instruments are, are, um, are properly sanitized and uh, do not have any contamination on them, uh, we would be in a lot of trouble. Um, th so their blood is, is, is not red like ours. It's not uh, iron-based uh, like human blood is or mammal blood, but it is, uh, in fact, based on what, copper is copper, it? Copper, And that correct. makes their blood blue. Correct, once it hits the air, it, it's blue, and each year, uh, 600,000 animals around the world are harvested to bleed, and the, they don't kill the animals, just like us giving um, some blood. Um, the animals are, after 24 hours, are re released back out into the wild and there are no problems from them. Um, so and they the donate blood too? They do donate <laughs> blood too. Um, the, um, the important thing, however, is that the blood, which has become a um, kind of focus for a whole host of, of research activities, everything from cancer research to what have you, um, is, is unique. It, it is, it's, its chemistry is been attempted to be reproduced in laboratories and around, literally in, around the world, and it hasn't been able to get to the point of being as successful in dealing with endotoxin, which is basically the most critical thing, gram-negative bacteria. If you get gram-negative bacteria in your, in your respiratory system or your circulatory system, it's called sepsis, and that's a death sentence. So for all intents and purposes, this fellow here saves everyone lives by protecting them and every hospital in the United States has the chemical that's made from um, limulus, it's called limu um, limulus amoebocyte lysate, LAL, and LAL is a $250 million industry each year and those 600,000 uh, animals uh, um, bled around the world. If that was the only thing that the animals were used for, it probably wouldn't be as big as a conservation issue. But uh, once you use them for bait, they're out of the mark, they're out of the population, and, and they're lost. And that's been the real debate at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where the, this is their, uh, their heart is just below this, um, this uh, joint. small joint there. And uh, the, they're folded and, um, and then bled. And uh, it's something like um, um, a milliliter is $1,500 or something like that. So it's very, very, uh, uh, unique and special. Uh, to show you how special the, and how quick it is, uh, there used to be what was called a rabbit test. You would line up all these rabbits. They had hundreds of thousands of rabbits, and then they would expose them to certain um, bacterial contaminations. But it would take 48 hours to, to get a result, and so and you had to have a fever built up in the rabbit and, and kind of a, a, a mammal, a mammal um, uh, test. But um, LAL is instantaneous in its testing. And why it's so important, um, NASA uh, used LAL when the space shuttle was operating, putting satellites up. All the satellites that go into, into outer space are coated in gold uh, because of its uh, uh, long-term survivability. And, and so they would have these clean rooms, and they would go in with the LAL and spray all the satellites to see if there's any contamination. So it was uh, wow. from the horseshoe crabs. Amazing. Now I've had uh, some people ask me, how do you tell when you see something like this on the beach if it's, uh, if it's a molt or if it was it passed away? Okay. And I think there's a really easy uh, 
way to see it if we just flip it over. Yes, um, th if this is a molt, and the way you can tell the molt, um, usually because it's it's also much smaller, uh, by the time they get to the size of, uh, and the females are generally larger than the males, it's called sexual dimorphism. The, you can tell the difference mm. between males and females by looking at them, and you also by the, uh, the reproductive scar on the females. But right here in the front portion, cooperate a little bit here, um, is uh, what happens with the molt. They just crawl right out. And you so can see when that they, right When here. they're ready to molt, that, f that uh, shell there, just that prosoma just splits right, right there at the right. seam. And they would just crawl out of their old exoskeleton. And then their new exoskeleton will be bigger, right? Yes, yeah, so it'll be larger. And, and, and one of the, the um, when paleontologists and, and conservation biologists look at these animals and they try to come up with what, what's the overall scenario making these animals so successful? Um, you know, w uh, what they eat, uh, how they reproduce, what their habitat is. This is one of the critical things. Generally speaking, invertebrates that molt um, do not, uh, let's take lobster and, and shrimp and other crustaceans. Now these are not true crustaceans, but they, they're uh, closely related. Once the molt happens, the newly molted animal will harden over a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. If you're a lobster, if you're a shrimp, it takes some time, maybe even up to two days, before it, the carapace the and, and the exoskeleton leaves. is hard enough to protect them. And this is basically their protection against predators. So horseshoe crabs, it's almost within a few hours, the animal is hard enough to be protected. So that's one of the cont contributing factors to their survivability. Mm -hmm. Now, you said that these, this was an ancient creature, and it just so happens that I was able to find a, um, a fossil, <laughs> which looks very similar to a horseshoe crab. I see it doesn't have a telson, or maybe it was just uh, broken off, I don't know. But, um, uh, but look at the similarities between these two, uh, these two creatures. Yes. They have that... that uh, they, they are um, ancient cousins. Um, again, the trilobite has a, a similar, has a prosoma, it has a portion, a tail section. Uh, but an interesting thing uh, about uh, both of these animals, I have a colleague, a friend and colleague who has been working, um, she's a geologist and she's been working on how these animals molt because trilobites, when you collect large numbers of trilobites, and there were thousands of species of trilobites mm. that have been uh, studied by paleontologists. You see the uh, molt. This may have been, not been a molt because it's pretty flat and um, you can actually has a little relief to it. When uh, trilobites molted, their prosoma would be pushed back, similar to what oh. happens today, but here the animal crawled out of the molt here on the, the this would have, have would have been folded back. So when you look at huh. trilobites, all of the fossilized trilobite remains have this tortured look. So um, Dr. Iwasaki from Japan, who a colleague at Fordham University, has been studying the molting of horseshoe crabs as related to trilobites to get a sense of what what would have happened. Why would an animal uh, molt in the sediment? Because that's where these were mo mostly found. And she believes it has to do with predation pressure. What uh, There weren't yeah. all of the 445 million years ago, there wasn't this wide diversity of vertebrates. As a matter of fact, bones hadn't uh, evolved yet. It was all invertebrates. So many of the things that might have been about there, but also um, these animals had different types of predators. And, and they how they migrated might have made a difference into where they would find the right sediment in order to molt and to grow. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole host of things there that, that need to be studied in the connection to, uh, to their ancient history. Um, the one might ask, um, how, what are the characteristics? I said some of the characteristics about their ability to harden, ability to eat, uh, consume a, a range of food from detritus to invertebrates. Um, their ability to uh, reproduce with large numbers and have the proper habitat. Um, but when we study them today, we're finding, um, besides the pressures of development um, more and more toward the coastline, uh, in the United States, for example, every, um, every man, woman, and child in the United States spends about 10 days a year in some type of coastal activity. Um, 
a 7.5 billion populated Earth, two-thirds of those people live near the coastline. So the coastal areas are tremendously uh, under tremendous pressure. Uh, societies developed and started along the coastline. So you have wildlife trying to use these coastlines. You have people trying to live there and also vacation there. So there's and a lot all of pressure. their pollution coming out, and uh, we have issues every day. You read in the newspaper, there's some kind of pollution issue. And yet these guys have all survived five mass extinction events. And here we are at what well, might, there's a new book out right now, a wonderful book uh, called The Sixth Extinction. And this may very well be one of the, ho hopefully not the, the poster child for that event, but we don't know what the population numbers are on a global scale. We know for e the other three species in Asia are all declining. In Japan, for example, uh, there was a certain beach that was monitored for some 50 years. This, in the past year, there were two breeding pairs that oh had come ashore. No. There used to be thousands of them. Uh, when we do our work um, at Malloy College, we, we do um, an and we've been doing this for 15 years. Um, it's called the Long Island um, Horseshoe Crab Habitat Survey, Inventory of Habitat. We monitor 111 beaches from the tip of Brooklyn to the tip of Montauk. Mm -hmm. Each year we have 50 volunteers out right now doing the, the beaches, uh, uh, and the key time is during the, the high tide and full moon in June and July. And uh, what we've seen is it's not so much the numbers again, as I mentioned before, in the animals. It, it's, uh, it's catch as catch can when you get out to a beach and volunteer programs are a little different than if we camp out at the beach all the time. So we get, get the numbers, the numbers have kind of stabilized. They ha they've declined a little bit, about 1% a year over the last decade. However, what's more critical and truly maybe these animals are presenting what I've called the silent siren it's really, when you look at the beaches that support the animals, those have been declining at about 9 to 10 percent a year. Oh, wow. So give it a decade, 10,000 animals a day in, in Singapore being consumed. The next decade is going to be critical for these animals on the planet. So it's, it's really important um, that, that we try to conserve them, try to conserve their habitat, try to con protect them in their breeding range try to make sure that we study them, not only just in their numbers, but look at their habitat and how much habitat is there. And that's the toughest one, because right now, prime real estate is along the coastline, and it has been for many years, and it's e building even more so today. So we really need to work hard at protecting this species, not only for nature and all the animals that, that live around uh, and off of their eggs and, and, and off of them in the ecosystem, uh, but also for our own purposes, because these animals, are s their blood is saving human lives like every absolutely, day. Absolutely, absolutely. So we really need to keep this ancient order of species around for forever. Correct. Um, so maybe one thing, though, that anybody could do that is coming around to a beach and they see a horseshoe crab, um, especially if it's, what, flipped over, because right, right. sometimes the waves or something can, f can knock them over. Absolutely. and. Now they're exposed in the sun and to predators. So they should just flip it over, right? Just flip it. And these are right. not stingers. I've heard a lot of people, they're like, well, don't touch it, it's a stinger. No. So they don't sting at all, right? Right, don't sting, they're totally harmless. And, uh, and uh, I call this their emergency flip over device. <laughs> right. And uh, they use that to, um, as you said, to, there, there he goes, he's trying to flip over now. Yep, there's, a, yep. there's a fulcrum there to flip back over. But if they can't do that because they're stuck in the sand or something like that, then uh, we should just give them a hand, flip them over, and uh, should we put them back in the water or just flip Absol them over? Flip them, put them right back into the water or just flip them over, either one is a good, good situation. So let's get them back in the water and so we can just help these guys then. Absolutely. And as you can see, I'm, I'm letting them just touch my hand and, and right there like that, and I feel a little few pinches and, and scrapes like that, but, but he's not hurting me, he's no, not no, biting, no. he's not stinging, he doesn't do anything like that. Totally so. harmless. As a matter of fact, um, th th that is absolutely correct. That would be a great effort in turning them over. And, um, and any effort to help animals, uh, are uh, certainly horseshoe crabs, is, is critical contributing to the whole idea of our health and, and the future health of these ecosystems because they share the ecosystems with, with birds and uh, fish and other, other organisms. One thing that we're doing, um, and we're doing this at, at CIRCOM, at the Center for Environmental Research and Coastal Oceans Monitoring at Malloy College, is that we've taken eggs, we captively breed horseshoe crabs in our laboratory. We have 10,000 juveniles produced a year. 
we take a thousand eggs, give them to, we gave them to Rachel Carlson High School in, New, in Brooklyn, to um, uh, colleges, uh, high schools in Staten Island, on Long Island, in Nassau and Suffolk County. They take the, the students, high school students take the, uh, the eggs into their classroom and they take care of them for that whole year, the whole semester. Oh, wow. And then we just, they just came out, we just had an event at uh, Malloy at the labs where the students, the high school students came out to us. We had, had a barbecue and then we released the horseshoe crabs into re-nesting them, putting them back into where they were collected originally. So Fantastic. now, uh, of course, only that's a real educational it, uh, program. It's a, every high school, every school, as a matter of fact, um, we just uh, um, finished the third international conference on horseshoe crab conservation and biology, and that was in Sasebo, Japan. And uh, we had uh, 18 countries, uh, 200 people, the scientists and researchers from around the world who were working on horseshoe crabs, both their pa uh, from their paleo to their present day. And one of the things that came out of it was um, a horseshoe crab toolbox. It's called, it's a curriculum. Any high school, any, anybody. Um, uh, you can go online and get a curriculum about anything about horseshoe crabs. You even have a, a couple of games that are going on there too. It's a Fantastic. cool little thing that's going on. And again, it, it can never be too much of a message about an animal that we don't see every day. It's, and it comes up once or twice a year, and if you happen to be on the beach and you happen to be walking there, you see an animal. But and on the East Coast. <laughs> right, that's right. So it's in general, in general it's, a, it's a tough uh, sell to be able to make these animals uh, as protected as the megafauna. And all animals on the planet are being impacted. But one way we're doing, trying to do that is with a group called the IUCN, International Union for Conservation Naturalists. It's, it's a UN na NGO, and um, it is the only NGO, one of the three NGOs that are allowed to give presentations at the United Nations at the General Assembly. And we are in a specialty group, scientific specialty group. It's t uh, eight scientists who uh, have a steering committee of over 75 scientists around the world who are trying to get these animals red listed by the IUCN. Red listing is the Global Endangered Species Act. Mm -hmm. And these animals definitely get in there. We've been working 12 years in trying to get this to happen. So it's a long process, but every educational program, every activity, every type of communication that can get the message out that these animals uh, are close to being a major, major loss on the earth um, is a benefit. So I, I really appreciate them. Um, you know, th this, the programming, the activity, anything looking at these animals is important. Great, thank you. And thank you for all the work that you have done with this uh, species and continue to, to work with them and training all these volunteers and, and all these staffers. It's a massive undertaking uh, to try to understand and save the species. So thank you very I appreciate much. It. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you.